I've got an idea. Why don't you allow foreign airlines to compete on American routes? There's so many amazing foreign airlines. I would love that competition. It would raise the bar so much here. Yeah, we all want to go on Singapore Air, right? Yeah. You and I both want to be on Singapore. Let them in. What's the problem? The notion of market corrections is kind of a weird idea for most people, and oftentimes even for economists, who tend to think markets have a problem, and that's it. You know, we will always pollute, for example. You know, they don't think about, you know, maybe there's some technological solutions that the private sector is working on, like carbon capture. CEO and Economists love studying market failures. It's the popular thing to do. A very few of them study government failures, of which there are many, as we are all aware. Cliff Winston at the Brookings Institute has been beating this drum for over 30 years. There are tons of government failures. Very often, just because there's a market failure, you try to intervene, the government failure is worse. And this is something that economists need to wake up to and need to map out better. Cliff is a great person to hear from on this topic. I'm Joe Lonsdale. Welcome to American Optimist. Cliff Winston, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you. Cliff, you're a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. You've been there since 1984, almost 40 years. And before that, you were at MIT. Is that right? That is true. PhD in economics from UC Berkeley, you went to London School of Economics, so, so strong academic background as well. Before we begin, tell us about your expertise and role at Brookings. You're, you're a microeconomist who specializes in, in regulation and markets? Yes, that's right. I mean, when I came, sort of Brookings had what they call a regulatory group and a macro group. And so I was actually a visitor and I was working on a project on airline deregulation, actually just assessing the effects of airline deregulation. So that fit in with the regulatory group. Uh -huh. And then when I decided to stay, then that's sort of what I continued to do, but broadly interpreted as you know applied microeconomics. Awesome. Airline deregulation, thank goodness we had that back then. Uh, I think most people are too young now to know what happened. Did you assess <laughs> that it was positive in your, in your, in your study? <laughs> oh, yes. Across the board. What, what's interesting, I don't know if you've seen now sort of, you know, revisionist attacks on it, but this sort of seems to happen, you know, anytime there's sort of a problem with airlines, you have a bunch of people that come out and say, oh, it was a mistake to deregulate airlines. And it's, you know, the same thing over and over again with most of these people attributing things that are really not the problems of the airlines, but oftentimes uh, the government uh, policy that surrounds them. Well, we definitely have lots of market failures left in that space and continue to be talked about. But yeah, you know, I'd like to start with your book, is indispensable market corrections in a US economy beset by government failures. And one of the things you write, which, I, which, I, which struck me was that economists generally believe that market failure is a greater social problem than government failure. Why do economists tend to believe that? And, and why are you countering that argument? Well, you know, it goes back to sort of, in many ways, sort of the evolution of economics, really, in, in more recent decades, where sort of all the cool work, if you will, was involved in theories of market failure. You, know, you probably know the names of Joe Stiglitz, uh, George Akerlof, Market for Lemons, you know, Mike Spence, these people all won Nobel Prizes. You're sort of pointing out why there were market failures was a lot more interesting than assuming the base case of perfect competition. And you know, many things have sort of been in that spirit. Mm -hmm. So sort of the theoretical instincts is that were that the action is really in market failures. And very little attention was given to govern failures. And so as things go on, people think, yeah, market failure is a problem. They never step back and say, well, is government going to fix this? Is it going to make it worse? You know, I think it, I think it evolves really from the theory. It's, it, it's uh, you know, I don't want to spend the whole podcast bashing government, although I'm sure we will most of the time. But let's start with some things the government's responsible for, like national mm -hmm. defense and maybe some aspects of transportation. Like, when is the government effective? What makes government effective? When's it get it right? Well, you know, it's it's hard for me to sort of systematically say, you know, this is what they, you know, should do. It's what they do do, and they do it well. You know, it, it tends, you know, in other words, where I'm going with this is trying to give some sort of 
systematic explanation for government success as well as government failure. Mm -hmm. And the truth is it's hard to find it. There's certain things that government certainly has done that have been successful. Obviously, it helped fund, uh, led to Google, it's funding, uh, you know, Genome Project, you know, various sort of things like that where they've given some, you know, uh, seed money for investment. So I'm going to push back on your Google. I don't know if yeah, the government yeah. really, really was responsible for that one, but I get what you're saying. They, they probably did yeah. things that helped, that helped to, to yeah. some very important inventions. You know, one, one of my biases here, I'm curious what you think, is that in the mid 20th century, after the Second World War, you had a total war. You had a lot of the most competent people in our society, part of government, and innovation was very expensive. So in order to innovate, you need to either be a giant company or a government institution. So I feel like because innovation was so expensive, the best people had to be part of it. Like they were able to do certain things in the 50s and 60s with moon moon landing program, with with the highways. They did they did things really well. And I feel like today, 70, 80, you know, 80 years later, uh, they're not doing things as well, be, partly because innovation is so cheap that you can do things well from a small group and you can be rewarded for it. So why be part of this giant thing? Is that is that part of it for you, or like like what are what are the trends for, against government here? Yeah, I mean that, that certainly, you know, it's hard to see um, that government's improved over time. If anything, it, it just seems that yes, less talented people are attracted to government, and more and more people find constraints working in government. Um, it just, it just, things are getting harder. Whereas at the same time, you know, the private sector is offering more opportunities. Um, obviously there's venture funding that helps broader participation of the workforce, whether it be women, minorities, you name it, you know, you'd be able to draw on a, on a greater base of talent. And all of those things, you know, go with the general theme that the private sector is dynamic it changes. You get new kinds of people coming in, new ideas, so on and so forth. Whereas the problem with the government is things are very static. It's very difficult to get fundamental changes uh, that you know adjust to what's going on in society. Yeah, and one of my passions is trying to make government accountable and, and you, you, you tie funding to things, sometimes you can improve it, but it's, it's, it's a mess. You know, let's, let's dive into some specific areas of government failure versus market corrections. Like, for example, one area obviously huge is anti-poverty, or welfare programs, like how has the government failed in that area? And, and are there other are other are better solutions or other ways market corrections can somehow do a better job? Yeah, let, let me let me at least step back a little, uh, before sure. sort of me accusing government of failing. Let's be clear on really what we mean by that, at least from an economic perspective. Okay, one way government fails is it certainly does things that reduce welfare. The, on net, there are no benefits from what it has done. Secondly, it does things, but they have sort of negligible effects. Um, but at the same time, they're spending taxpayers' money. So on net, uh, you know, this is this is a failure. It wastes resources yep. that obviously be used for the thing. The final thing, which is where we're talking about here with poverty, is there are some successes, but they're very expensive. That is, we could have achieved this at much lower cost. Mm -hmm. So you know, yes, it is true. On the positive side, poverty has declined. And some of government policies have certainly contributed to that. But it's so expensive to do that. And oftentimes there's you know multiple policies you know to address poverty, uh, as opposed to something that's more streamlined, more focused, so on and so forth. And there's very little attention to minimizing costs. Uh -huh. You know, whereas, you know, again, this is the pressure that you get in the private sector with firms. With government, they're just ready to write checks, come in with a new pro program, spend the money, point to it and say, see, it did things. And you point out, yes, but look what it cost you, right? And this sort of goes on and on and on on a, on a major part of their failures. Are there specific examples that strike you in this area? Are there, are there things where, where there's, there's principles they could be using to save money? Oh, there's plenty of principles. More often, usually don't do this. In other words, do cost benefit. You know, before spending all this money, ask yourself, one, what problem am I, the government policymaker, trying to solve? Is there a problem? Oftentimes, you know, they're trying to solve something that isn't really a problem. That's obviously the view of certain people on the antitrust cases we have going on now. Secondly, okay, we see a problem. Are we the ones to carry this out? You know, is this something that ultimately market could solve? Or do we have a policy? 
If we do, what are the chances of actual government failure? Where things could go wrong? So you know, there's a sort of you know checklist of things that you want to go through, but obviously this is not what government does because you can have failure along at any of these points. And more often than not, we just go ahead with things and there's never been any checks on what's going on. We just do it. And that's been in this idea of what you said, you know, assessment, retrospective assessments, that's just not part of the agenda. Have you seen people write legislation that would address this somehow? Like what's like, like is it because obviously we're not just going to get the bureaucrats to wake up one day and be more competent at their jobs. So what's what's the right way to approach this? How do we fix this problem? Um, that, that's a very tough question, more so than what people think. What I point out in the book is we really don't even know systematically why government fails. Oh, we can speculate about many things, but trying to find some hard evidence is this is why government fails. We have a theory, we test it, it applies to many things. We don't have that. That's what's sort of remarkable about all of this. We're sort of in the dark and there's no learning. You don't see this. You, know, you don't see government saying, well, we figured it out. Here's what we did wrong and let's reform our policy. That's exceedingly rare, right? The, the, the few policies that we see reformed are ones when government sort of gets out. They say, yeah, regulation was a mistake. Uh, we don't need to do this anymore. Let's deregulate. That's the kind of thing mm -hmm. that that's successful. Potentially with privatization, which I think could occur in a number of areas, government might say, there's no reason why we should own this facility. You know, let's privatize it. You know, those are the things where we can get some successes. I want to push back on that because I have seen government iterate towards better answers, right, with legislation. So, for example, uh, you know, I, I work on a lot of state level legislation. So the vocational schools is one area I'm passionate about. And it turns out that if you fund these state based schools, uh, in a competitive way where the, where the funding's tied to some kind of goal that they can't game, then the results are vastly improved. We can basically double the salaries coming out of these schools, for example, over some number of years by tying their funding to that goal of, of you know teaching relevant skills and high salaries. And so there's things like that where the government iterates and it works better. Is this not something economists study very much or is, is that a branch of economics? Well, no, no, no. Let me, let me be clear. Most of what I'm doing talking about is the federal government. So you know the kinds of experiments that you're talking about would be great if they translated, you know, at the national level. That you know, we can think of national programs where we can get these kind of competitive incentives. For example, there's yeah. training programs at the, at the national level. I think I studied. There's about 50 major training programs the federal government sponsors. And, and our hypothesis would be that if you tied the funding of those training programs to the salaries of people coming out, it would vastly change how they work, just based on the same way we're doing it in state's vacation. Yeah. But, but no, no one's done I, this, though. You know? I think it's plausible. I mean, the, 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 the scholarly work I've seen on the training, pro training programs, again, you know, for what you're paying in terms of what you get, they're not terribly effective. It's a disaster. No, it's, 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 it's a disaster is, my, is the work I've seen, too. So yeah. my point is, why not? Why not iterate and try different ways of funding them tied to some kind of accountability? Oh, right? Experiments are what this is all about. Yeah. You know, in many ways, that that's another problem with government is it doesn't experiment enough. Yep. And you know, unlike other countries, we have the benefits of states. Yep. So you know, we can do do experiments or learn from states. As a matter of fact, that is what got deregulation going. Really? You know, there was intrastate deregulation of airlines in both California and Texas. Hmm. Before we went to the national level, this was done at the state level. And national policy policymakers could see this is how this stuff is working. And they, you know, they they were attracted to that kind of thing. So yes, what you're talking about is definitely the direction we want to go with experiments and you know the, the kind of incentives you're talking about for state level program, that kind of evidence could be very useful. I love it. Well, that's what we're doing at Cicero, so that's good to hear. There's some areas, of course, have to be done federally. Uh, one area you cover a lot of is antitrust, 
And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on this now. We, you know, uh, Lena Khan's not my favorite bureaucrat right now with everything she's doing. But, you know, where, where has you – know, actually, it's funny. I sold a company for $1.8 billion last month, one of the companies we started. And it's the second biggest sale in three in like since 2021, thanks to Lena Khan. So, you know, I have to thank her for being on top of the record board because she's blocked all the bigger sales. Uh, but not, 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 not necessarily good for the country. Well, you know, where's the government failed and where, where, where has it done well in antitrust? What are your thoughts in this area? Well, this really in many ways is what, what got me going on this. Um, early 2000s, you know, we wrote a paper, and I didn't really have strong priors on this, about the efficacy of antitrust policy. Now, I went through all the evidence that economists had accumulated. I said, you know, where, where have they done well? You know, monopolization cases, collusion cases, merger cases. Where is there anything strong that shows, yes, consumer welfare has improved. This is what they call the Bork's test, the Borkian theory, which is you've, you've, consumer welfare is the number one thing to focus on here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, economists think of it that way, uh, certainly. And I found very little. And we wrote this paper up and got a lot of pushback, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Presented it at the FTC, DOJ, same thing. I said, give me the evidence. Yeah. Just, you, know, you give me the scholarly evidence. Where is it? So... I've been continuing to say this for decades now. Um, What's well, like a stalemate of their argument? Like, what have they accomplished when they push back and say, "No, we're doing important things"? I think I think what 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 they tend to say is, "Well, we did this." In other words, we stopped a merger. Okay, we brought a case against quote a monopolist, like even Microsoft, mm -hmm. right? You know, we won that case. Fine, that's not the end of the ball game. Mm -hmm. Then you got to see, okay, let's do an assessment. In the end, what did you accomplish yep. in terms of improving consumer welfare, social welfare by doing this? Yeah, did this help? That's the problem. Yeah. When you go through those kind of analyses, it's very hard to come up with some evidence as to, wait, this was really worth doing and look at, look at all the benefits we've got. That's the problem. And it seems like they're even going even more off the deep end right now with these anti-vertical merger theories that the courts strike down, but they still keep doing them. I don't know if you saw the Illumina Grill one. I wasn't personally involved in that financially, but I have friends on both sides. And you, you probably, you know, you know, Grill's a blood test that detects cancer and Illumina was gonna scale it up. And the models are that we probably would have saved, you know, at least a thousand lives, maybe a few thousand lives a month by detecting more cancers if you could have bought it and scaled it up. And they block that and they're, and they're proud to block it. And I think they got the EU to help them block it. So it's just, it just seems crazy to me. But and, and blocking is it. In other words, the story ends then. As far as they're concerned, you know, they did something good for the country by blocking it. They don't ever say, in retrospect, was this good? You know, what happened after that? Really, they don't go back and check their work 10 years, 20 years later. You think they'd be part of the department that was like, let's learn from what we did and what worked or not. That's right. Yeah. That's right. When our paper came out, there was actually an alleged plan uh, to do retrospective assessments and start saying, okay, let's pinpoint where things go wrong. They never did it. And to this day, I've never seen anything. Should the next administration, if we get someone in power who's who's more skeptical of government, put something in place to do retrospectives and, and try to and try to learn from these things? It'd be nice, but it's it's you know it's rare we see that kind of thing. So far, government should be conducting more experiments. And it should be doing retrospectives on what works. It sounds like oh, a, yes. it sounds like a well-run organization. And I'm, I'm skeptical it's possible, but it's it's exciting. <laughs> that's right. That's but that's the point. That I'm saying that you know, I, and let me go back to Brookings. You know, Brookings was the kind of organization that sort of believed in well-intended government. It just needed to get the right advice, right? So it says government could could do could do well. You know. It just needs help. Yep. We have to advise them, so on and so forth. And, you know, things like, you know, Walter Heller telling Kennedy to cut taxes. You know, that's so these high watermarks where, you know, we had academics come in and say things and they did them and they were good. So, you know, it's this sort of belief that, yeah, you tell them the right things, they'll do them. And decades, decades, decades of evidence is piling up. No. They don't listen. They don't <laughs> implement it right. There are just too many complexities, which we really don't understand. And at the same time, and this is really the other point of my book, you know, markets do self-correct. 
they have incentives to do so. Um, you know, there are opportunities that they want to take advantage of. Obviously, innovation and technological advance gives them the freedom to do so. But markets rarely get credit for doing these kinds of things. But they're extremely important. Well, that, that's well said. I'm biased in that direction because I build things in the markets. But anyway, I agree with you. Uh, you know, one area that kind of overlaps with these is there's government efforts to promote innovation, right? Tax credits, subsidies. Yeah. Uh, Democrats and Republicans, I think, alike, you know, both dole out tax incentives. What does the data tell us about what actually works to benefit society on, with these ones as well? Very, very poor results, as you'd expect, though, mm -hmm. right? The private sector already has incentives. You know, some people go as far as to say, look, we need to get rid of all of this. No patent system, you know, no payment, you know, no subsidies or contests or any of that. So most of my experience in my life with patents, you know, I've built a lot of businesses and invested in a lot of businesses. It's mostly yeah. trolls harassing us and wasting our time. And it's mo so it's mostly not useful. The one area where I do think you need patents is I think in like therapeutics, because you spend, especially right. the way we said it up, you spend a billion dollars developing a drug. If you didn't have the patent, you couldn't do that. So, so there's things like that. Maybe it's still useful. That's right. And the evidence says that there are probably some selected areas, pharmaceuticals, you know, yeah. that kind of thing, where yeah, patents may may have a payoff. You probably know. shouldn't be. There probably should not be software patents. For example, I say this is someone who's built tons of software companies. Like you, it's probably not necessary. It probably just just helps bad people. So that's very interesting. Let's uh, let's it just generate litigation. Yeah, no, it makes money for lots of lawyers and and lots wastes a lot wastes so, a lot of my time. By the way, that's another part of the problem that doesn't quite get enough attention. Mm -hmm. is the legal system and lawyer and the legal profession. I mean, th this is all about them because you know, they are the most highly represented profession in government. Most of it's a lot of it's lawyers. I mean, they have a, a whole branch of government and obviously in Congress, that's the leading profession. It's actually something that I think we're not, you don't get angry enough about how broken this is. I, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. I had a friend over yesterday and he, we grew up in the same town together, Fremont, California, and there was a little coffee shop in, in our district that all of our parents went to and that they still went to. He's still living there. And, and uh, a lawyer came in a couple of years ago and noticed that this little old lady running the shop didn't have ADA compliant restrooms. So he sued them. Right. And then she's out of business and the, and the old beautiful little shops closed now. And it's just because right. of some random lawyer and, and a, a you know, frivolous lawsuit. And it's, and it, and I guess it's not frivolous because he, he won his ADA thing, but it's just, it just seems unnecessary in terms of what, how these things work. Exactly. In terms of you know, what kind of training does someone get to do that? Right. I mean, I go back to the legal profession. Remember, this person went to law school. Yep. And you ask themselves, you know, after three years of law school, this is what they want to do with their time. Yeah. You know, this is what you're taught. That, that's a good thing to do with your knowledge of the legal system, which, you know, very few people have. Right. Why don't you spend some of your time helping people who aren't represented? by the legal profession, which is basically 85% of the country. What are some good solutions? Like, uh, like I, th I think I think you said deregulate all the lawyers. I, I mean, I love oh, yes. the sound of that. Absolutely. How do we do this? Absolutely. How do we do this? No, this is, this is the broad area called occupational licensing, mm -hmm. right? So in this country, you know, there's, there's a large fraction of the workforce that needs licenses to perform their, their task. Now, the theory behind this is, well, there's imperfect information. So, you know, if some consumer comes to have somebody, I don't know, do their nails, mm -hmm. <laughs> perform surgery, you know, from high things to low things, they don't know if the person's any good. And so we want them credentialed in some way, give them a license. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that will help us. Now, whether that is true or not, many years ago, it's hard to believe now with the revolution in information technology that we have trouble finding out about the competence of people. Yeah, we can have our own groups that do this in the private markets that we trust. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So all occupational licensing is doing is putting up entry barriers to, to new suppliers, raising prices and limiting service uh, because you know there are not as many people around. So in the case of lawyers, my sense is this, look, the legal profession can be free to provide credentialing all they want. But my sense is you don't you shouldn't have to have anything to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Compete on your own. And we've seen people actually do this illegally, but they were successful. <laughs> that, that is there was a there was this kid who actually had a website called you know askmehelplaw.com. Uh -huh. He was in high school. 
and he would get questions and just look them up in the library. That's funny. And he was the most you know heavily requested person on this website. <laughs> and you know, there are lots of examples of you know people sort of you know providing service with with actually it's um, not having the license to do so, and they they get charged with this. But there are many things that you really don't need three years at a fancy law school to provide and allow the market to determine this. What's the statement or argument against this? I guess like, I guess it'd be annoying in the courtroom if there's like all sorts of unprofessional people wasting the judge's time or something, or like, like what are they pushing back on? I, 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 oh, what they're pushing back on is competition. That's fair. Comp yeah, I mean, and part of that, of course, you know, we don't allow foreign law firms in this country. I mean, the entry barriers for lawyers are enormous. And actually, even state level competition, in other words, you have to be a member of the state bar to provide certain services. So there are people who are out of state that can't compete with you. Wow. So, you know, the amount of rent that the legal profession earns are enormous. And at the same time, you know, my concern is they're just not helping people. Who, yeah. who often could use some legal legal advice. Well, that's very fair. I mean, doctors and health systems do this too. Let, let's let's back up at a high level. Uh, you yeah. know, reg regulatory overreach, regulatory system. There's there's I guess there's more than a million restrictions at the federal level. I think the average state has like nine million words in its regulatory code. Uh, one study mm -hmm. I really like found that without the regulatory buildup s since like the late 1940s, you know, to early 2005 you would have had like three times higher GDP, it would have been maybe 39 versus 13 trillion. So just tons of wealth destruction from this. Uh, so, so, so how do we right size governments? You know, one of my favorite ideas is, is, you know, automatically sunsetting regulations and it with a process where technology helps do it to make sure it actually happens. But, but I mean, what, what are some of your favorite ideas to address this massive mess? Most of it really gets involved in getting government out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, where I've seen any progress, is cut back their activity where at all possible. Have experiments to give them confidence that if they get out, they won't be harmed, there'll be benefits. But trying to get reform within the system, we just have not seen any evidence that we can get anywhere with that. There's certainly some good ideas. The problem is getting them to do it. And with little incentive, it just doesn't happen. So I'm asking you, Dr. Winston, as someone who's yeah. who's I'm in a lucky position because I have like 25 people working for me. We're drawing up laws. We have governors and legislators taking our advice in a bunch of states. What are the types of laws or things we should be doing specifically? I agree with you about getting government less involved. What specifically yeah. should we be doing in these states to prove this out? Like, do, do, are there ideas you have along? Oh, those lines? I would love to see experiments on ending occupational licensing. Mm -hmm. I would like to see that. Is that what Governor think, Ducey did in Arizona, where he reduced a lot of licensing requirements? They're, they're no, what, I think you know, what they're doing is they're allowing certain types of practices uh, to be done by people who don't have a law degree, you know, okay. like helping people with their wills, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something like that. Just let's see when you give people a chance. Let's open up more areas people. where there's no licensing and no rules basically for people that, and, and, you know, other than- But the market, determine, there are yeah. rules. Yep. There are rules. There's still laws. There's, there's, there's still don't laws. Don't think that. In the sense, That's fair. The market will discipline them. There's okay. a demand side who are consumers who are gonna get information about you. There's yep. a supply side where you've got to compete with people. Yep. Let's yep. see how well that does. But there are even other things. You know, Why do we have airports in the public system now? You know, why is it that Atlanta, mm -hmm. the busiest airport in the country, there's only one airport in that area. Yeah, they make it really hard to open new airports, huh? That's kind of crazy. Oh, uh, yeah. impossible. Yeah. I mean, impossible, yeah. right? I mean, Atlanta has one and it's had it forever. But, yeah. you know, where I am, there's three and they could compete easily. Yeah. Easily compete with three airports. That's and true. so that's, you know, one example where, again, let's let some competition loose and let's see how it does. I think it's, it's clear it would do well. I love it. Well, there's there's a ton of areas like this in our society. There's new areas right now people are trying to regulate too. I, I'm involved in the artificial intelligence technology world, of course, it's a big thing in, in the venture capital world. People are talking a lot about AI safety. Given what you've told us, you know, what's the right way to approach novel technologies like AI, dri you know, driverless cars, all these types, sorts of things. Oh yeah, that's that to me is shaping up to be a tragedy. AI and with autonomous vehicles, and we have written about this, have the potential to provide enormous social benefit, a true game changer. We're talking trillions in benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the most obvious ones obviously are on the safety end. 
Um, you know, there's no doubt that these things will work. I mean, you have the best minds in the world working on this. Is not just a U.S. thing by any means. Yep. You, know, you have people all over the world competing on this. It's, we're going to get there. All right, so you're going to get you know a lot of benefits in terms of safety, reduce congestion. You put these things together, obviously, with electric vehicles. And so you'll have autonomous electric vehicles, help obviously on the environmental end, but even other things. For example, we hear about police stops and then somebody, you know, was shot and you know, yep. typically a minority, uh, that kind of thing. You're not going to be stopping people with autonomous vehicles. Yep. You're not going to have those kind of social problems, right? When you need social distancing, you're going to get it. I mean, you just have to start thinking more and more about it. And you see, God, the potential for this is enormous. So here's my question. Where's the federal government on this? Why aren't they leading the adoption of autonomous vehicles? And they can do so mm -hmm. by setting testing standards nationwide, by setting ultimately adoption standards. This is how they're going to have to be, so on and so forth. There was one piece of legislation in 2008, uh, yeah, 2000, what was it, 18, 2018, called AV Star. It was held up in Congress. It was supported, and McConnell didn't bring it to a vote, and it died, hmm. and it has not been resurrected. So in this case, you're against them making too many licensing rules, but it's still important to make some kind of standard to help adoption, basically. That's right. I mean, th this is the way it works for non-autonomous vehicles. You know, you and I just can't make a car yep. and start selling it and say it's ready for you to go on the road. Yep. Right. I mean, the truth, you know how this thing works. I mean, you'll deal with the regulatory agency. You'll educate the regulatory agency. Mm -hmm. Right. You'll know more about the car than they do. But okay. you'll tell them, look, this is a good car. And you know, they'll say, OK, we'll think about it. And they'll probably, you know, talk with other car maker or who knows, or maybe even one of your people. And then they'll and put some rules in place. This is what we're doing with air taxis right now. Yeah, like, same, it's exactly area. the same yeah. thing. They don't know anything about it. They'll learn from you. But my point on AVs is this is something that there's such a huge social benefit. They need to encourage the process that we get going. So now, since we don't have this at the federal level, you see what's going on at the state and local level. Yep. So you do see testing going on, um, you know, near, you're in Texas, right? We are here in Austin, Texas. So you're, you're, you're seeing autonomous trucks being tested, mm -hmm. right? A whole network there, mm -hmm. right? So that's, you know, one area. But again, that's Texas is doing this, right? But this should be done and led at the national level, saying, look, we want these things on the road as safely, but as soon as possible. I'm generally against more government, uh, but maybe there should be some part of the federal government whose job is to do innovative things like this and to push things through the regulators. Absolutely. For this case, absolutely. You know, why this is not a focal point. Uh, Buttigieg and the Department of Transportation is beyond me. He's more worried about racist highways, I think, than he is about innovation. It's just a different focus for him. We started American Optimist to push back against a lot of cynicism and division in our country. What's the what's the best optimistic you know future? What's the best case for an optimistic future of government competence and healthy market dynamics? How, how we get there? I, I think, look, just a better recognition and appreciation of markets and the evolution of markets. I mean, that really was the point of this book. The notion of market corrections is kind of a weird idea for most people, and oftentimes even for economists, who tend to think markets have a problem, and that's it. You know, we will always pollute, for example. You know, they don't think about, you know, maybe there's some technological solutions that the private sector is working on, like carbon capture, oh. right? This is an example of a, of, a, of a powerful market correction. Or how about... You know, we don't think there's enough airline competition. I've got an idea. Why don't you allow foreign airlines to compete on American routes? There's so many amazing foreign airlines. I would love that competition. It would raise yeah, the bar I mean, so yeah, much. We all here. want to go on Singapore Air, right? Yeah. You and I both want to be on Singapore. Of course. Let them in. What's the problem? Let them in. You know, it's all that kind of thing that really involves a certain situation now and allow some correction to solve it. That's you know an appreciation of markets being able to do that, especially if government could do that, because then they could say, okay, here's where we think we need to turn them loose, and realize that.
I mean, you know, Alan Blinder, who is who is certainly not aligned, let's say, the way you think I am. I mean, I, I consider myself independent. Alan is certainly liberal. Was saying though that the biggest problem or a big problem with government is thinking long term. Mm-hmm. That's really all we're talking about here. You know, if there's one thing that would greatly improve government and government performance is thinking long term. But these guys only think to the next election. And that's, you know, a, an, an inherent problem that makes it difficult to solve problems. But again, it also shows a difference between government and the private sector. I mean, you're in this business. You've got to think long term who your competitors are going to be what opportunities are going to be, what technologies. When you're the owner of something, you have the incentive to think long term. That's right. You Otherwise, to. you're in trouble. And government doesn't. And that's really where things have, have a big problem. Well, Dr. Cliff Winston, thanks for joining us. Your book's Indispensable, Market Corrections in a U.S. Economy Beset by Government Failures. I hope we can get to know you better and conduct some experiments together. Thank, thank you for your work. Happy to do so.